Gersonova terapija metoda je iscijeljivanja tijela pomoću posebne prehrane i detoksikacije, čime se poboljšava prirodna sposobnost organizma za samoizlječenje. 20. godina 20. stoljeća razvio ju je njemački liječnik Max Gerson, pokušavajući izliječiti vlastitu migrenu za koju tada nije bilo lijeka. Eksperimentirajući na sebi, otkrio je da ga vegetarijanska prehrana lišena soli lišava mučnina i glavobolja, a preporučivši isti tip prehrane svojim pacijentima, slučajno je otkrio lijek za lupus i tuberkulozu za koju tada nije bilo lijeka. Nakon kliničkih ispitivanja, Gersonova terapija postala je poznata u cijeloj Europi, a s vremenom i osporavana od strane raznih interesnih krugova. Max Gerson odavno nije živ, ali je štafetu promicanja Gersonove terapije preuzeo njegov unuk Howard Strauss, osnivač Gersonova instituta. Porazgovarali smo ovdje, na rubu znanosti. Dobro večer. Howard Strauss, unuk je doktora Maxa Gersona, njemačkog i kasnije američkog liječnika koji je stvorio danas svima znanu Gersonovu terapiju. Howard Strauss također je autor knjige, doktor Max Gerson, liječenje beznadog i također je jedan od najvećih poznavatelja Gersonove terapije u cijelini. Dobro večer. Good evening. Što je Gersonova terapija i na čemu se temelji? The Gerson therapy is an uh, organic, <coughs> is an a holistic Uh, health, uh, holistic health procedure that is based on uh, nutrition and detoxification of the body and supplementation with, uh, with chemicals and, uh, and trace elements which should be part of the body to begin with but are generally missing by the time somebody becomes ill. So you, you nourish the body to make up for the, uh, for, for the lack of nutrition, for the deficiency in nutrition. You detoxify the body to get rid of years and years of poisoning of the body. And then you add, uh, you add minerals that the body should have, but that are lacking in its normal nutrition. Vratit ćemo se kasnije na detalje Gersonove terapije. Tko je bio Dr. Max Gerson i kako je došao do svojih otkrića? Uh, Dr. Gerson was born in Vongrovitz um, in Posen. At the time it was Germany. Today it is uh, Vagrovitz in uh, Poz- Poznan, uh, which is now Poland. <clears throat> After World War I, of course, that part of Germany was uh, given back to Poland. Um, he, uh, he was... Uh, uh, He was the son of a relatively well-off, uh, but not, not wealthy, but well-off uh, Jewish oil press, um, uh, oil press operator. Uh, his father operated a press for various different seeds, including flaxseed, uh, and produced oil and then sold the press cake as cattle food. Um, it was a relatively well-off uh, Jewish family. And so uh, his father and grandfather were very, uh, very much involved in charity, in giving back to the community, and in uh, taking in people uh, who did not have very much resources. That's part of the duty of a Jewish family. Um, he, he had a very uh, a good education. Uh, the, the local school system was good. Um, there was a certain amount of anti-Semitism involved, as uh, any pre-war Germany, uh, uh, any pre-war German school or organization uh, could expect. But that was just part of the landscape, and uh, you got used to it. Um, however, when he when he was supposed to go off to uh, <clears throat> to after high school, go off to university. Uh, he had shown a, a, a very strong predilection for being brilliant in mathematics. His family looked around and saw that there were no, uh, there were no really good positions 
for uh, Jewish mathematicians in German cultural society. So no professors, no, uh, uh, no high-ranking mathematicians. <clears throat> they were all stuck at the gymnasium level uh, being teachers, being instructors, and they had better ambitions for him than that. He had also shown an early, um, an early uh, attraction for healing. So whenever a friend of his would injure himself or uh, in play, even at a fairly young age, whenever a friend of his would injure himself, uh, Dr. Gerson, Max Gerson, would be the one to bind up the wound and make sure it was cleaned and, and, and taken care of. So they suggested that the family suggested that it would be better for him uh, to study medicine because uh, there's no ceiling, no glass ceiling for Jewish boys who studied medicine uh, as there was with mathematics. And so they, uh, they enrolled him in medical school in, in Germany and he, he went through university and then medical school and the medical school at the time I don't know how it is today, but at the time, they, they would study with, uh, with experts in a particular area of medicine uh, at one university, and then if they wanted to study a different field of medicine, they would move to another university where that was a specialty. And so he moved around to several different universities studying with the best of the best. So far, he was being educated as a regular doctor, a regular MD, with, uh, with drugs, with uh, chemicals, with um, knowing how to treat people based on the common medical paradigm at the time, which was good because uh, Germany at the time was at the peak of its science, medicine, uh, biology, physics, mathematics. It was at the peak of its powers. This was before World War I. Um, so he was getting a very good education. One thing, uh, when he, when he, when he uh, graduated from medical school and went to be an intern, one thing he was suffering from, however, and he had suffered from for a long time, was migraine headaches. Uh, he had terrible migraine headaches. He had such bad migraine headaches that he had to spend uh, three days at a time in a completely darkened room, uh, motionless because he was in such pain from the, from the headaches. Well, he figured, uh, I'm in the center of medical knowledge. I should be able to find out how to solve this problem. And he went to all of his professors and all of his instructors and everybody who knew anything about uh, physiology and nerve problems, and everybody said the same thing. We don't know anything about migraines. Uh, so he... He said, no, I'm sorry, I can't live with this for the rest of my life. If I can't find a solution, I'm going to jump out the window. Uh, so he took it upon himself to study everything he could find about migraines in, in any different language that he could find literature. And he, of course, was in the center of all medical literature collection uh, libraries uh, in the world. Um, he, if he found something in a language he did not understand... He would have it translated into either German or Polish uh, so that he could understand it. And, um, and uh, he tried to learn as much as he could. It was very frustrating. There was no really good information for this incurable disease. But finally, in a 1700s, 18th century um, Italian medical text, he ran across one reference to a doctor who said that uh, uh, a change in nutrition... Uh, well, he had one patient who a change in nutrition sometimes influenced her uh, migraine headaches. That's all it said. And he said, well, may as well try that because nothing else had worked. There was no other ideas at all. And so he started uh, developing a, 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 an elimination diet, except the other way around. It's a gradual addition diet. So he started out with one one thing, one thing in his diet. He started out with milk. Figure, he figured even babies, even little babies, can, uh, can digest milk. Uh, and he started out with milk, and his migraines continued unabated. Mm, had to rethink that one. He said, okay, that's not, that's not a good one. And then he looked around at the other primates and the other uh, mammals, and he said, 
he, he thought to himself, look, uh, no other mammal on the planet, after being weaned from the mother's breast, uh, uh, continues to eat or drink uh, uh, milk products. And there must be a reason for that. And so, uh, and so he, say, he looked around at the other mammals and other uh, primates especially and to see what their, uh, what their diet was, like monkeys and apes and, and other primates. And he said uh, they mostly existed from uh, vegetable sources, uh, plants, leaves, fruits, and so forth. And so he tried for a, for a week eating nothing but apples and apple sauce and apple baked apples and, and mashed apples and any apples in any form he could get. And it was rather of a boring diet, but for a week he had no, no migraines at all. And he said, aha, now I have the beginning of two different lists. Foods which cause me migraines, foods which do not cause me migraines. And over the course of a couple of years, he divided all of his inputs, all of his, uh, all of his meals, all of his foods and, uh, and, and drinks into, foods which, into those which caused him migraines and those which did not cause him migraines. And then he had two lists. And as long as he stayed on that side of the list, on the no migraine food list, he would, uh, he would not have his migraines. Of course, he was ecstatic. And he existed like that for quite a while. He found that the only time he actually got a migraine then was if he cheated and hopped on the other side of the list. Uh, the story then jumps forward. He was a surgeon during World War I in the German army. He, he worked in Poland uh, at uh, the Charité um, Hospital for Otto Furster, who was the preeminent neurosurgeon at the time, and uh, who was taking care of all the German nerve injuries from, uh, from World War I. And so he got quite a bit of experience in, in nerve injuries. And, uh, and then he went out into private practice after the war and settled in Bielefeld with his new wife. And <clears throat> in Bielefeld, uh, he... Uh, he said, put out his shingle, nerve and inter internal diseases. And a certain number of the diseases were, uh, were migraines. And he would, uh, he would then write out those two lists for his patients and say, eat these, don't eat these, and uh, come back to me in a couple of weeks and tell me if your migraines have been helped. And in fact, he got excellent results that way. He got such good results that he eventually had those two lists printed up as tear sheets, and when the patient would come in saying, I have migraine headaches, he would just tear one of those sheets off and say, eat these, don't eat that, and, uh, and come back in two weeks. And he got very good results for a while. Then one day, uh, one of those migraine patients came back to him in a few weeks and said, your migraine diet also cleared up my skin tuberculosis of 25 years standing. And skin tuberculosis had been known for thousands of years as incurable. <clears throat> so Grossman said, no, I'm afraid some country bumpkin doctor has misinformed you uh, and uh, because lupus is totally incurable. If you ever have it, you'll, you'll never get rid of it. And the guy said, I knew you'd say that. Here are my records from 25 years of the best sanatoria and experts in Europe uh, saying that I had lupus. And Gerson got quite excited because he saw in front of him a patient who had had lupus but who was now scarring up and the scars were working, uh, the scars were healing quite nicely. And he said, do you know anyone else with, that, uh, with, with lupus? And, of course, from his travels and from his many stays and experts and so forth, he knew lots of people with lupus. Pretty soon, Grossen had a thriving uh, lupus systemic, I'm sorry, not systemic, but uh, lupus vulgaris, uh, which is skin tuberculosis, practice going. And he found that uh, he, he had very good results with skin tuberculosis. What he also found, and this was accidental as well, what he also found was that when lupus, when lupus vulgaris, skin tuberculosis, would clear up, 
almost, uh, almost always the, uh, the, the uh, patient would have some other chronic uh, degenerative disease as well. So they'd have lupus and migraine, or they'd have lupus and diabetes, or they'd have lupus and kidney or lung or bone tuberculosis. And those would clear up as well. So he had another departure from what he had been told. What he had been taught as medical practice was for every disease, there is a treatment. And for every treatment, there is a disease. And yet here he was with one treatment clearing a multitude of diseases. And he had to rethink what he had been taught about medicine and how medicine worked and how the body worked. And after quite a bit of thought and uh, study, he finally came to the conclusion that what he was curing was not a set of symptoms defined as a disease. What he was curing was the body's own healing mechanism. So the core of the, of the body's health mechanism, which maintains homeostasis, was, was, the, uh, uh, was what he was actually approaching. So that was another major departure from, from what he was uh, uh, taught. And that's how, the, that's how the therapy started, and it continued to be developed from there. Zanimljiva je priča da je dobitnik Nobelove nagrade Albert Schweitzer imao pozitivnih iskustava s Gersonovom terapijom, toliko pozitivnih da ga je nazvao, eto, citiram, jednim od najeminentnijih medicinskih genija koji su kročili među nama. Inače, ta dvojba u uzroku bolesti ide u prošlost sve do pastera, kojeg se inače smatra ocim teorije klica, koje je naravno smatra da je na klica uzrok jedne bolesti. Manje poznat njegov oponent Claude Bernard, koji je smatrao da je klica ništa, podloga je sve. Očito, Gerson se našao na lidi, liniji Claude Bernarda. Uzbuđen zbog svojih rezultata, Gerson je njih i objavljivao 30-ih godina i razgla, razglašivao na sva zvona. Što se zbivalo nakon što je 30-ih proširio svoje otkriće, kakve su bile pozitivne reakcije struke, kakve su bile negativne reakcije struke. It was, it was an interesting response. Uh, when he started curing tuberculosis, you must remember that at the time tuberculosis was a major money-making disease for doctors. Uh, it was rampant uh, throughout Europe, much as cancer is today. Uh, this was long before antibiotics. And antibiotics are fading as a solution anyway. But this was long before antibiotics. And so um, surgeons were making their money with, uh, with tuberculosis and uh, drug, drug companies were, having their, uh, were making a lot of money with tuberculosis. Uh, so when he started curing it with, uh, with diet, uh, some people responded well. Some people responded very, very badly because he was destroying their business. As an example, uh, the, you, you've seen all of the beautiful, huge hotels uh, in, in places like Kitzbühel and, uh, uh, and, and uh, the Matterhorn, uh, uh, all of these ski resorts, right? They didn't start out as ski resorts. They started out as tuberculosis uh, sanatoria because the theory before Gerson was that, uh, that the crowded conditions and the, and the unsanitary conditions in cities where people were crowded together uh, was causing tuberculosis, and that the rarefied, high, clean, pure air of the Alps would, uh, would help. Uh, that was a, that was a wide, widespread theory. Um, When Gerson started curing people who lived down in the cities by changing their diet, uh, all of the uh, people discovered they didn't have to pay these outlandish, expensive uh, sanatoria uh, to get well. They could get well by simply changing their diet. So all of these, uh, all of these uh, expensive hotels, all of these expensive sanatoria, Had to, ch- had to change their business model and, and eventually became ski resorts. So whenever there is a disease, a big major disease like tuberculosis or cancer these days, you will, you will see there is a, there is a, large, <clears throat> uh, a large constituency making money off of those diseases and not happy to see those diseases 
cured or prevented because then they'd have to find something uh, useful to do with their time. Uh, other doctors, like um, <clears throat> some of the top tuberculosis specialists at the time, Ferdinand Sauerbruch, for instance, the, uh, the, top, uh, the, the top thoracic surgeon in Europe for decades, uh, was running a tuberculosis clinic in, uh, in Munich and invited Gerson to do a clinical trial in Munich. He, uh, he offered 450, <clears throat> 450 um, terminal tuberculosis patients, and he said, if you can influence one of these cases, I'll believe everything you say. So he set up a, uh, he set up a, a clinical trial at Munich, at the uh, tuberculosis ward in Munich, with 450 uh, terminal tuberculosis patients. Uh, and after an initial trip of, uh, that, that uh, Zauerbruch had in, in keeping, keeping the patients eating properly, um, uh, eventually uh, 446 out of those 450, that's over, 90, over 99 percent, recovered totally. 446 out of 450. This is from disease that Zauerbruch had said, if you can influence so much as one of these patients, I'll believe everything you have to say. So uh, Gerson became an instant, instantly recognized, world-recognized name <clears throat> for the treatment of tuberculosis, and he got to lecture in all the medical schools all over, all over Europe, uh, doctor's symposia, he went on the radio, uh, he... Uh, uh, his treatment eventually became the de facto uh, standard for treating uh, patients with immune system deficiencies uh, in Germany and uh, large parts of Europe. He published, he published very widely. He had uh, several dozen papers uh, published uh, in the finest medical uh, journals of the time. Uh, and he was, his, his uh, writings were very much uh, sought after and accepted, and other doctors confirmed his papers with papers of their own, and that's the standard of, of medical proof, is that you know, other people try your experiment and, and, and in fact succeed in the same way that you say that you, they can succeed. So hundreds of papers, literally, were published in Europe uh, about uh, the Gerson therapy, by Gerson and by many, many other uh, medical scientists. So uh, there was a mixed reaction. The people who were making a lot of money off tuberculosis saw Gerson as a huge threat, and the people who were suffering from tuberculosis were very much attracted to it, and some doctors who really wanted to solve the problem uh, researched it and used it and were very impressed by it. So, so there was a, a, a very definite split in how people responded to it. Nakon svih dobro poznatih zbivanja vezanih uz židove i nacističku Njemačku i seljenja iz zemlje u zemlju, konačno je Max Gerson došao u SAD. Tuberkulozno je kao glavnu bolest pomalo istiskivao rak i tada je on je objavio svoju knjigu Terapija za rak, rezultat 50 slučajeva. Bilo je to dosta uzbudljivo vrijeme, bilo je puno kongresnih saslušanja. Što se sve sa Maxom Gersonom zbivalo u Americi? Uh, actually, was outside of Bielefeld in 1928 and, uh, and, and she asked him to come and treat her with his, with his migraine diet uh, because she had heard that it worked for tuberculosis, and she had been given up for dead by her conventional physicians with, uh, with, with intestinal, uh, with, with cancer of the midsection. And, and uh, Gerson said he didn't want to approach it because he knew nothing about cancer, but she insisted. Well, he applied his migraine and tuberculosis diet to this patient, and lo and behold, it succeeded in banishing also the cancer. She then brought him to other patients, um, friends of hers, who he gave the same treatment to and who uh, also recovered. So his first three cancer cases, mind you, uh, an incurable disease, right? His first three cancer cases were cured. And from then on, he became obsessed with the idea 
that he had something to add to the cancer question. And he continued to learn and read and study as much as he could, anything he could find about cancer, and all he found was contradiction and theory and uh, speculation. He couldn't find anything definite. But he continued to uh, apply where he could uh, the therapy. Now, having been forced to leave Germany and hopscotch around from Germany to Austria to France to England and eventually... <clears throat> settling in the United States, uh, tuberculosis was, a, was still a problem in the United States. Um, they also had uh, their theories about, you know, moving out west to, uh, to the clean air of the west instead of the industrial cities of the east uh, would, uh, would help tuberculosis or high mountains or something like that. But Gerson showed that uh, you could uh, solve the tuberculosis problem with diet. Um, the first clinical trial in the United States uh, was, was done by a doctor who, <clears throat> who uh, had visited Germany looking for uh, solutions to tuberculosis from Saranac Lake in New York. And uh, he brought back the Gerson therapy and... He started using it on patients, and he found that uh, the patients were doing fine on Gerson's therapy, but the other doctors in his uh, medical society uh, were very, very angry with him for uh, breaking their rice bowl, essentially, and, and eliminating the disease that he was curing, uh, and that they were making money treating. So... Uh, so he uh, so he was influenced heavily to sabotage the uh, to sabotage the experiment, and despite his promises to Gerson, published the results without giving Gerson a, a shot at uh, at commenting. <clears throat> so from then on, the, the the Gerson right away Gerson's reputation in the United States was sullied. Uh, but he, uh, but when he uh, settled in the United States, he finally uh, he started treating tuberculosis and was very successful treating tuberculosis in the United States. But he was seeing that uh, cancer was a growing problem. Back at the turn of the last century, it was a one in fifty problem. One person in fifty would get cancer or far less. Today, it's a one in two point three. So it was already uh, on that rise. <clears throat> Uh, and since he had had success with cancer in Germany, he decided to apply his, his uh, therapy uh, to cancer. And after a few stumbles, uh, he refined his therapy and refined his therapy. And after a few stumbles, he came up, he, he figured out what had to be changed and what had to be modified so that he could consistently get good results. And he consistently got good results. Now he added a whole new population of doctors to those people he w whose business he was injuring because cancer was being built up as a very lucrative um, uh, uh, business to, to, uh, uh, to get into because uh, it was very painful, very frightening, and could be treated until the patient died uh, and make the doctor very rich. So curing it was not a very popular concept. And eliminating it, so which if, if you know how to cure it, you obviously know how to eliminate it, prevent it, right, uh, was even less popular. So he, uh, he became immediately, he, he, was, he was barred from any kind of publication in the United States, although the medical journals in Europe still continued to uh, accept and print his, his, his papers. Um, uh, but the, he, his name, even his name is forbidden still in medical journals. You cannot find his name in medical journals today. Um, at one point, one of his, uh, several of his very famous patients uh, prevailed upon uh, uh, Senator Claude Pepper, who was holding hearings in, uh, in Washington, uh, to have Dr. Gerson testify in front of Congress, which Dr. Gerson did. He testified in front of Congress... Um, and he brought with him five patients who had been declared incurable by other doctors who were clearly there and alive, 
several years after uh, they had been treated for incurable disease by Gerson. And um, the entire medical profession went bonkers. They, they went crazy. Uh, and they started a major uh, campaign of slander and calumny and, and, and suppression and everything else. They, they wouldn't let him present. They wouldn't let him publish. They, uh, they, they called him names in the press every chance they got. And, um, and it was, uh, he, he became a major enemy. But, um, but his patients loved him. Put novce dosta lako slijediti, eto Nixon još 1972. objavio rat raku, rekao je da samo treba investirati dovoljno novce i problem će biti riješen. Od tada je investirano oko 39 milijardi dolara. 1972. 220 tisuća ljudi umrlo od raka, 1997. 560, što znači da ta uh, politika se nije pokazala baš najuspješnijom, ali pokazala nešto drugo. Pa možete nam možda vi s, svojih saznanja opisati te uh, interesne odnose u Americi, kako funkcioniraju institucije poput uh, uh, FDA, odnosno administracije za ljekove i hranu, što je to sustav okretnih vrata, što je to pojam agency capture, odnosno na hrvatskom bi se mogao prevesti kao preuzimanje nacionalnih agencija. Um, what happens is that, uh, the, is that the pharmaceutical companies who, who literally have a multi-trillion dollar a year business The pharmaceutical companies can perpetrate all the fraud they want and all of the uh, and, and they can tell all the lies they want and they do um, and and they make sure that their top executives get jobs and positions at the food and food and drug administration is not federal drug is food and drug administration uh, the FDA FDA stands for me it stands for Fraud and Death Administration. So, so they, uh, they can get their own executives into the top positions at the Food and Drug Administration, and the top executives then make uh, decisions that are favorable to their former employees, pl- employers. And they serve uh, several years a term at the Food and Drug Administration, and then they leave back for private industry, which is the firm that they left To, uh, to come to the Food and Drug Administration. They then get rewarded massively. Uh, this, is their, this is their payoff for having made these favorable decisions. They get recorded, re- rewarded massively for their, um, for their decisions at the FDA. This is not just a matter of the FDA. It's the Food and Drug Administration. It's the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture. It's the Department of Transportation. As a matter of fact, it's every agency uh, in the federal government has suffered what's called agency capture. Is where executives from, uh, from one of the companies they are supposed to be regulating become senior executives at the, regulate, uh, the, the regulatory agency, make favorable decisions for their old employers, return to the employers and get richly rewarded. That's called the revolving door, and it leads to agency capture. So the agency acts as a, as a federal, as a governmental uh, uh, force to force people to do uh, what is commercially advantageous to their former employers, to their employers, okay? And, uh, and the result is millions, billions even trillions of dollars uh, of benefit that go where they should not be going. That's Na, agency capture. Od čega se zapravo sastoji Gersonova terapija? The Gerson therapy um, is, is based on the, first of all, on the understanding of Gerson that, uh, that degenerative diseases, chronic degenerative diseases, which are by definition incurable, are caused by deficiency, nutritional deficiency, and, um, uh, and toxicity. Nutritional deficiency is caused not necessarily by starvation, because nobody in the United States is starving. Everybody is so overfed, it's, it's, it's grotesque. But, uh, uh, but instead, it's the huge consumption of calories without nutritious value. So they, 
uh, they eat and eat and eat and eat and get no nutrition. That will lead to nutritional deficiency or starvation of the life processes that you need to maintain your good health. So that's the uh, that's one of the problems. The other problem is that we add so much trash to our food. We add food chemicals, we add MSG and aspartame and uh, uh, food processing chemicals, flavorants, coloring agents, uh, uh, preservatives, and so forth. Uh, at the same time, as we are removing the nutritious value, so we're, we're ending up with dead, poisoned food sitting on our supermarket shelves. Uh, that we, we, it, looks, it looks and tastes like food, but it's not food. It doesn't n- nourish us. So we have to somehow reverse those two conditions. Well, when you're starving, how do you, how do you uh, uh, repair that problem? Well, you feed the patient food which you know to be nutritious, and that is organic vegetarian food, food which is grown without artificial pesticides, without artificial fertilizers, uh, and not processed, not with a lot of salt and food chemicals added. Uh, the toxic, the toxic load that we carry in our liver that has, that is added to the problem, so we have toxicity and, and nutritional deficiency, the toxic load um, that is generally collected by our liver but is diffused throughout our body, um, has to be removed somehow. And to do this, we have a very, very powerful detoxification process called the coffee enema. And that's the most powerful detoxification we know of. If we knew of a better one, we'd use it. Uh, and, uh, and so we, we, and we want to avoid putting in more poisons. So we don't you want anything that's been processed, anything that's been grown with artificial fertilizer, pesticide, and so forth. Like, for instance, one of the big controversies right now is that the most widely, uh, widely used herbicide uh, on crops is called, called Roundup from Monsanto. Uh, the active ingredient, supposedly, is glyphosate, G-L-Y-P-H-O-S-A-T-E. Glyphosate has been declared by the World Health Organization as a, a class 2 carcinogen and has been banned in many countries. In the United States, we have officials from Monsanto now being now occupying the top positions at the Food and Drug, uh, sorry, at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and uh, and approving more and more foods that can be sprayed with Roundup and increase our load of Roundup uh, of, of of glyphosate in our bodies. This is leading to all kinds of cancer. It leads to autism and 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 other problems. So, so so. We have to reverse those processes, and the way we do it is by detoxifying the body with the coffee enemas and by re-nourishing the body, not just by eating organic vegetarian foods, but by by flooding the body with organic nutrients through the use of 13 fresh-pressed juices, fruit and vegetable juices, all day long, every hour on the hour, uh, a, and another juice. So the patient gets put through his body about 15 to 18 pounds, that's uh, 7 to 8 kilos of, uh, of organic material uh, through his body every day. That's a lot. The only way he could really do that would be with juices. In addition, we are lacking trace minerals uh, that should be in our food, but that have been lost due to our agricultural methods and food processing methods and so forth. And so we supplement with, uh, with, with chemicals that should be in the body, like potassium and iodine and so forth, that aren't in the body. So when we, when we add those back in, the trace minerals that are necessary for good health are restored. So when you, when you restore the uh, nutrition... And when you drain off and, and flush out the, the toxins and then give the body the trace minerals it needs, it responds with a, with a power and speed that is amazing to watch. Glavni institut za Gersonovu terapiju danas se nalazi u Meksiku. Gdje se još nalaze instituti i klinike koje se bave Gersonovom terapijom? No, the institute, the Gerson Institute 
is in, uh, is in San Diego, California. Uh, the, there, there are two clinics where patients can be treated um, in the world. One of them is over the border in Mexico because the United States will not, will not allow cancer to be cured within the United States. It's far too lucrative of a, of a disease. And the other one is outside of uh, Budapest in Dobogoko in, uh, in Hungary. And uh, they, uh, they, provide, uh, uh, they provide the full Gerson therapy, the certified authentic Gerson therapy, uh, to patients who stay there for, uh, on average, about three weeks, and then go home and do the therapy themselves for the next year and a half or two years. Zadnjih godina Gersonova terapija dobro je primljena kod nekih japanskih onkologa. Što se na tom planu zbiva u toj svima nama dalekoj zemlji? Well, the, the, first, the first of these, uh, of the two doctors, is a medical school professor named uh, Yoshihiko Hoshino, who, uh, who, who, who was uh, diagnosed with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, colon cancer that had spread to his uh, liver and pancreas. And uh, usually that means that he is a dead man. Um, pancreas cancer does not respond to uh, chemotherapy at all. And liver cancer, uh, once it's in the liver, they tell you even God can't save you. So he, didn't, he opted away from conventional treatment for, because he knew that. He opted away from conventional treatment uh, for, uh, for something else. And he looked around and he found the Gerson book, which had just been translated into Japanese, and he treated himself on the Gerson therapy for his, for his cancer. Uh, and while he was doing that, he also treated a dozen other patients with different kinds of cancer uh, on this therapy, and all recovered. So he was very, very impressed with this, and he wrote a book about it, in Japanese. We, we don't have access to it in English, so we can't tell you what it says. But, um, but he wrote a book about it that has sold very widely. Uh, and, he, and he also had a friend, uh, also a medical school professor, but an, also an onc- oncological surgeon uh, in, uh, in Tokyo, uh, who he suggested uh, try the therapy as well. Uh, and this, uh, this friend tried the therapy as well on some of his patients, and he was very impressed with its results as well because he was getting good results. And so not only did he write a book, he also published several papers, all of which are Japanese, <laughs> Japanese or Chinese. Uh, and um, his name is uh, Dr. Watayo, Takaho Watayo. And... Um, I've had the dinner with both of these men in uh, in Japan and they are they're fully uh, they're fully aware of the Gerson therapy they use it they have they've done tests on it they've measured they've published on it uh and they published their own books on it uh, Dr. Watayo's book has a, he had 200,000 printed and they sold out in a couple of months so um the, the it's in Japan Word of mouth spreads very rapidly because everything is so tight, tightly packed together that, uh, that people talk a lot. And so uh, it's very well known in Japan. I've lectured over there for uh, a dozen years. Jeste li vi osobno imali neugodna iskustva kao posljedicu promocije Gersonove terapije? Anybody who gets close to it will, be, will have some experience with it. Anybody who gets close to doing, you know, advocating Gerson therapy, writing about it, uh, lecturing about it, anything else, will be attacked, and of course I am all the time. Um, uh, I, I opened a clinic in Sedona, Arizona, and the, uh, the medical association uh, set their dirty tricks department on, on us and uh, um, did everything they could to put us out of business. And eventually, we couldn't stand the onslaught. Um, I run a publishing company, and we are constantly being, uh, our computers are being hacked, our files stolen, our, our uh, emails interfered with. It's, it's, it's just part of the, 
it's like my mother and uh, my grandfather in Nazi Germany. You know, it's just part of the landscape. You have to expect that when uh, um, when you're on the wrong side of uh, of the the paradigm or the powers that be. Poste određene sličnosti i veze između okolnosti u kojima je vaš djed došao do svojih otkrića, 30 godina u Njemačkoj i današnjih interesnih lobija, pa naravno i jednog od glavnih, a to je farmaceutski. Neka važna imena američke ekonomije i politike stalno zapravo iskaču. Um, the Rockefeller Foundation for Medical Research uh, has been researching and studying eugenics for uh, over 100 years. Eugenics is the science of culling populations and, uh, in, order to, uh, in order to eliminate um, undesirable genetic traits, such as, he doesn't look like me. <laughs> okay, that's an undesirable trait in some places in the United States, many places in the United States. Um, so, so there's quite a bit of uh, racism and uh, prejudice that goes on. Uh, the Rockefellers certainly had their share of it, and, and they, they had an overlay of that was that uh, they thought that there were far too many human beings on the planet, and the human planet could get along with a lot fewer human beings, and the uh, natural resources would last much longer. So they started studying uh, eugenics and uh, population control about 100 years ago. Uh, to that end, they had, a, uh, uh, they had a Nobel laureate named Alexis Carell working in their laboratories. He's a brilliant, brilliant geneticist. He was also the world's leading theorist on eugenics or population culling. Um, and, um, and a lot of what he and the Rockefeller Foundation developed is now coming to fruition today. Uh, at one point, I mean, Rockefeller was a big uh, Adolf Hitler fan. At one point, uh, the Rockefeller Foundation sent over some experts in uh, eugenics over to Germany to help Hitler set up his extermination camps. Uh, Hitler's long gone. The Rockefellers are still here. Um, so so uh, there was that, that connection. And then the second, the second connection between uh, Gerson and that whole, that whole effort, the, the, the Holocaust, in addition to Hitler having, having eliminated most of his family and most of my mother's family as well, um, was that uh, Adolf Hitler, a uh, little known fact, a Adolf Hitler, it's well known that Hitler was a non-smoking vegetarian. What's lesser known is it was because he was using the Gerson therapy to treat his digestive problems that he had gotten while a prisoner of war in Austria after World war, uh, during World War I. So his, his doctor, Ferdinand Sauerbruch, remember I, uh, I mentioned Ferdinand Sauerbruch, uh, his doctor uh, put him on this, uh, this therapy that he knew to be effective, which happened to be the Gerson therapy, which at the time was being called the Gerson Sauerbruch Hermannsdorfer uh, therapy, which of course Hitler refused to say the word Gerson because it was so, you know, Jewish. Uh, he would call it the GSH diet, and um, and Zauerbruch administered it for him. And Dr. Gerson, when he found this out, didn't know whether to be proud or disgusted by the whole thing, uh, and eventually stopped thinking about it. <laughs> but um, but that was while he was exterminating our family, of course, Hitler was on the Gerson therapy. <laughs> I naravno teško je ne uvidjeti da je upravo farmaceutska industrija koja i danas ima tako jaki utjecaj svoj rast imala baš 30. godina 20. stoljeća kako u SAD-u tako i u Njemačkoj gdje je praktički bila i ekonomski motor a čak i uh, ratni motor uh, Trećeg Reicha. Uh, remember that many of the uh, many of the perpetrators uh, of the of, of the uh, Second World War of the war and genocide and so forth. Many of the perpetrators were heads of uh, chemical companies such as BASF and uh, Krupp Kolechime and so forth. Um, they were eventually tried for war crimes and put away in Spandau for a while, um, and, but eventually released. And within about 10 years, they were back at the heads of those same companies. 
uh, the EU, it turns out, is, uh, is a major effort uh, by those companies to achieve what Germany tried to achieve by arms twice, by armed conflict in World War I and World War II, domination of the world, uh, or of Europe at least. Uh, and uh, they, they decided to do it instead this time by, um, by economic and political means, uh, making the EU uh, one big government. So they had a single point of contact and a single point of pressure for their political in initiatives. So, yeah, it's, a, it's definitely an effort <clears throat> and an outgrowth of, uh, of the industrialists who supported, and, uh, uh, who supported Hitler and, uh, and, and the, um, the Holocaust. Gospodine Strauss, hvala vam na vašem vremenu. Želim vam sretan put gdje god putujete i laku noć i doviđenja. Thank you very much. I appreciate your having me on. Hvala.